I mean, a lot of it is what you would expect. It's very respiratory based. So it's coughing, it's uh, asthma type symptoms. It is uh, sinus. It can begin to uh, impact your sinuses, uh, runny nose, sneezing. Um, a lot of times if you go into a home that's been, that has a significant mold issue, these are things that you can start to notice pretty much immediately. Uh, but then also homes that have less significant issues, but you're, you spend a long time in them uh, and you've got that exposure over time, uh, that chronic exposure, that that's where you can really start to notice a lot of these things. And these are things that tend to be pretty universal. Uh, it can trigger multiple chemical sen sensitivity uh, where they can begin to react to chemical products uh, that are in kind of everything we surround ourselves with now. Um, uh, chronic inflammatory response syndrome, a uh, variety of different issues where basically their, their body just begins to react very, very strongly and negatively to a whole variety of stimuli. Uh, and it can almost act like a... Uh, almost like an immune issue uh, in the way that it presents. So there's a whole variety of different uh, issues that can come about um, related to mold, but also because it weakens uh, so many different aspects of your system, it can begin to exacerbate other issues that you have going on. Welcome to the Radical Health Rebel podcast with your host, Lee Brandon. If you enjoy the podcast, please leave a five-star rating and a warm review. Your opinions are important. And your ratings help grow the podcast and help educate people to lead a healthier, more productive, fulfilling and happy life. If video is your thing, please check out the Radical Health Rebel YouTube channel where you'll find fun bite-sized clips from each episode. And now, here is Lee, the Radical Health Rebel, with this week's podcast. Tim Swackhammer, welcome to the Radical Health Rebel podcast. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. I uh, appreciate the time. It's great. The first thing I have to do, Tim, is congratulate you on your surname. <laughs> Swackhammer, where does that come from? I'm guessing it's German. German originally, and it was uh, butchered a few different times on the way over. But Cool, cool. Yeah. So, yeah, well done, well done for such a great surname. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, not one you come across very often, that's no, for sure. I'd, I'd certainly not heard of it before. But um, <laughs> do, do you know the origins of it? Uh, not extensively. Uh, my uncle's very into, like, the genealogy and everything. Uh, and he was able to trace it back. With my, at least the Swackhammer side has been in the country for quite a while. Um, but couldn't really get beyond more or less our local area. Mm. Yeah, it, so it sounds almost like a blacksmith type name. That's that's always been kind of the assumption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah my my family name we believe is a farming name, like, like uh, from branding cattle. Okay, but we're not sure, but that's what we, <laughs> that's what we think it might be. Anyway, yep. So today's episode is entitled "The Deadly Dangers of Mold" with Tim Swackhammer. And we all know that mold in our homes is not good for us, but it's apparent to me that many people do not realize the extent of the damage that a moldy home, car or workplace can do to your health. It's also even more of an issue in today's world as the electromagnetic radiation from our electronic devices has also been shown to greatly increase the potency of mycotoxins, the toxins excreted by fungus. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation, Tim, to delve deep into the world of mold, its dangers, and what we can do about it. So to kick things off, Tim, can you share with the audience a little about you, your background, your professional education, and your career to date? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my background's a little bit interesting, and it's uh, pretty different from a lot of uh, others in the space. I do not come from really a contracting or uh, environmental health background or anything along those lines. Uh, I actually got into this through the business side of things. So I'm a second generation entrepreneur. Uh, my f I grew up with my father being involved in a number of different businesses, some franchises, some other ones, uh, and started working for uh, him at a chain of uh, dollar stores that he had uh, at six or seven years of age wow. uh, and just learned work in the register and all that. And just uh, it definitely gave me a different perspective than a lot of other people and gave I guess whenever you're exposed to that kind of stuff as a child, uh, you can kind of go one or two ways. You either 
fall into it and become kind of obsessed with it, uh, or you want to rebel against it and want nothing to do with it. Yeah. And uh, I fell in the former category there. And so basically went through graduated high school, uh, went on to college, uh, pursued a degree in criminology uh, for both my undergrad and my master's, because mm-hmm. uh, at the time that's something that I was uh, interested and passionate about and uh, really just love learning. Um, but really, as I got more exposure there, it was clear that that wasn't a career path that I wanted to follow. Uh, so ended up, uh, while I was in college, uh, we had opened up a couple different uh, wireless stores through a business that my father was involved in, uh, and it changed and evolved into a family business. Uh, so we grew that business and really just started to uh, want to get away from just having everything all or all of our livelihoods invested in just one business. So we started to diversify, Mm -hmm. get into some other stuff, uh, stumbled onto a home service brand uh, that we got involved in. That didn't really work out. But with that, I saw kind of from the outside, the opportunities within the mold and indoor air quality space. Um, And particularly coming from my background with uh, sales and customer service, I really saw that there was a lot of good contractors in the space Uh, But there wasn't anybody who was really focusing on providing, number one, an excellent customer experience. And that was something that was severely lacking. And then number two, uh, I noticed specifically with indoor air quality issues, there were a lot of people that are very much affected by health or their health is very much affected by mold. Mm -hmm. And most of the restoration industry, at least in the States, is very much focused on insurance work. So if a you have a flood, you have a fire, any sort of water damage, those kind of things. Uh, the restoration company really partners with the insurance company mm. to come in, restore the home, get it back to restoration, uh, and get it back to the way it was before whatever damage occurred uh, or whatever loss occurred. But what we identified was there was a lot of people who were experiencing mold issues, either lingering from experiences like those or just from defects in the home uh, not proper maintenance of the home, problems with the building, uh, building construction or building science, all these kind of issues that could really be impacting their health. And number one, most of the restoration companies weren't interested in dealing uh, with those issues. Mm-hmm. And two, a lot of these people who had more significant health problems related to indoor air quality issues, uh, they weren't really interested in learning about the people and what their specific needs were. They were very focused on just the property itself. So uh, I always make the joke, and uh, my wife uh, loves to make this joke, that I don't have a hobby, but my hobby is researching other hobbies. Uh, And she's definitely onto something there. Uh, I'm very much a researcher. I love to learn. And when we started Mold Medics, I really just kind of dove in headfirst to learning as much as we possibly could about Uh, Not just mold issues, but specifically toxic mold and people's experiences with these issues and what have they found as far as remedies that have worked, what has not worked for them, and really how can we customize our approach to uh, really be the ideal solution uh, for these clients. Okay, that sounds really interesting. So I guess the best place to start would be you know, from the research that you've done, what what would you say are the main sort of health repercussions of being, you know, around any kind of mold? Yeah, so there's there's kind of two categories. The first is the more or less universal ones. So, and I use that term very, very loosely because every person is different. Every person's unique. Uh, their immune systems are unique and their responses, their sensitivities uh, are unique as well. So nothing's truly universal, but there are definitely some things that are a lot more common. And then there are some health implications that can happen to individuals uh, that have a greater sensitivity to mold, either from their individual biology or from uh, a past exposure that has uh, left them more exposed to mold issues. So on the, the universal side, I mean, a lot of it is what you would expect. It's very respiratory based. So it's coughing, it's uh, asthma type symptoms. It is uh, sinus. It can begin to uh, impact your sinuses, uh, runny nose, sneezing. Um, a lot of times if you go into a home that's been, that has a significant mold issue, these are things that you can start to notice pretty much immediately. Uh, but then also 
homes that have less significant issues, but you're, you spend a long time in them uh, and you've got that exposure over time, uh, that chronic exposure, that that's where you can really start to notice a lot of these things. And these are things that tend to be pretty universal. Again, everybody's unique, um, but they can definitely, uh, they definitely present in most cases sooner or later. Uh, then on the other side of things, you do have individuals that have sensitivities. Um, and unfortunately there's a number of different, I've heard a number of different numbers thrown around. There's not a lot of really great research in this space. There's starting to be a lot more, which is great. But, uh, what is there right now is, uh, relatively confounded. There's some conflicting information. Um, a lot of the traditional medical establishment is barely starting to kind of dip their toe into, this end of things. Um, but there's, there's a group of people say it's one in five, uh, that do have a greater, deg greater degree of sensitivity to mold issues. Um, and they can experience a much more significant issues. Um, so ranging from skin problems, um, uh, it can trigger multiple chemical sen sensitivity, uh, where they can begin to react to chemical products, uh, that are in kind of everything we surround ourselves with now. Um, uh, chronic inflammatory response syndrome, a uh, variety of different issues where basically their their body just begins to react very, very strongly and negatively to a whole variety of stimuli. Uh, and it can almost act like a, uh, almost like an immune issue uh, in the way that it presents. So mm. there's a whole variety of different uh, issues that can come about um, related to mold, but also because it weakens uh, so many different aspects of your system, it can begin to exacerbate other issues that you have going on. Mm. So we're talking, so respiratory, we're talking skin. It can worsen other issues. It can make other sensitivities more intense, if you like. Are you familiar with, with um, Doug Kaufman's work? Um, the name is not ringing a bell, but to be frank, I am terrible with names. Okay. He, he wrote a book or a series of books, but the volume one is called the fungus link. And he basically suggests that every disease known to man is caused by fungus. I'm not too sure that I agree with, with what he's saying, mm -hmm. but you know, he goes through in his book and explains many, many conditions that fungus can cause and what one of them that he talks about is cancer now of course that's that's an issue that's very prevalent and obviously is one of the major um, causes of fatalities yep. in, in the world the other thing that i think i've seen in my own practice with you know i mean i use the terms mold and fungus interchangeably i'm not sure if you think that's okay or not but um I do tend to use them interchangeably. But the other thing that, that I tend to see a lot is fatigue mm -hmm. and yes. quite severe fatigue um, yep. when, when people have fungus in the system. Fatigue, brain fog. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the symptoms that people come to me with, you potentially could be caused by fungus, but then they might be caused by other things as well. But um, I guess, I guess the point that both of us are probably trying to make is that, is that a lot of conditions potentially can be caused by mold in your home. And, you know, it's certainly been my experience that when you m remove someone from a moldy environment and you clear fungus out of their body, that they do kind of return to, let's call it optimal health again. Yep. And that's that's been very much in line with our experience. I mean, I I do... If you hear me treading kind of carefully around some responses, it's I very much like to uh, stay within my core competency. And if I feel myself venturing out from that, I'll I'll generally decline to comment because I didn't yeah, I want to make sure if I'm speaking, I'm speaking on something and uh, I'm very well informed on. Um, and that being said, we really do tend to focus more on the issues, causes and resolutions for these issues. Mm -hmm. um, and I remain very much adjacent and very much interested in the, uh, the health side and the, the person side and what we can do to help improve those problems. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's completely understandable. Just to, just to kind of elaborate on the point of Doug Kaufman. Mm -hmm. I mean, he actually says that cancer is fungus, not just that it 
causes cancer that actually cancer is fungus, um, which is quite an interesting comment. It and, is. Um, there are some people that, you know, they just say, no, that's completely untrue. Some people say, yeah, that's completely true. And there's other people in the middle say, well, it could be true. It's, I think it's definitely something very interesting, something I'll for sure do some more research on because I'm, I'm very curious about it. I mean, my, my kind of gut reaction is uh, I think it's, it's a very interesting idea and it's something that because uh, anytime we're talking about environmental issues in general, um, it does get very, very difficult to really unwind the confounding that exists between the environment and the individual's health. Mm-hmm. And uh, again, whenever you get into so much of the individual responses uh, to stimuli like mold, uh, it makes it very challenging to identify uh, how much of it is an individual versus universal uh, type of experience there. Mm. When you, you know, if we're talking about someone's environment, we're talking about their epigenetics, you know, so, you know, there are a lot, a lot of people that believe, again, I'm, we're kind of talking about cancer again, but, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of people believe that cancer is a genetic disease but then there are other people that say but well, your genes don't really do much they get told whether to turn on or to turn off by the environment which is what we call epigenetics mm-hmm. so you know i think the one thing we can probably everyone can agree on is important that you have an environment around you that's as healthy as possible yep absolutely and that's i i think with that too i mean i'm i'm always hesitant anytime anybody's anytime somebody says everything is one thing or another um, I think we are way too interconnected. There's too many different systems at play at any given time to point and say this one thing causes everything. I think it can it influence absolutely, mm. um, but I think there's always going to be a, a myriad of different factors that can uh, that can influence things, and that's what that's what makes things so interesting. It's what I mean. It's the randomness. It's the chaos of life. Mm. And interestingly, I did have that discussion in episode three of the podcast with Paul Leendertz, um, which was entitled The Root Cause of Cancer. And he actually knows Doug Kaufman reasonably well. And, and he talks a little bit about the discussion that he had with Doug Kaufman about fungus and cancer. So if anyone wants any more, you know, wants to delve in deeper into that, you can always look back at episode three. It's interesting. Yeah. I guess before I go into the next question, what might be useful is... What would be your definition of mold? Uh, so mold is, I mean, you, you mentioned earlier using mold and fungi interchangeably. Uh, mold is a type of fungi. Uh, it's a, a classification. Uh, all fungi are not molds, but all molds are fungi. Uh, so uh, really, whenever we talk about mold, it is a microorganism that grows. Uh, it's challenging because mold does provide a useful aspect of the circle of life. So Mold in nature is designed to break down dead plant material. That's its job. That's its purpose. Uh, it needs to exist. It needs to do that. Uh, if it didn't, whenever you went outside in the spring, you'd see leaves piled up everywhere and dead trees, and uh, it would never break down and become part of the earth. So the problem is we generally build our homes out of dead plant material. So uh, whenever we're doing that and we're providing that food source for mold, uh, all we have to add is water, and then we can create issues inside our homes. And uh, so it, it can be a good thing, and mold's going to be everywhere. Uh, it's really about controlling our exposure to it and making sure that we're not trapping ourselves inside a box with uh, significant levels of mold. Mm. Which, which leads me on nicely to, to my next question. How does someone know if there is mold in the home? Or I, I guess I should say a significant amount of mold in their home? So uh, it can come about a a variety of different ways. So uh, customers will contact us. uh, Sometimes it'll be because they are uh, in the process of buying or selling a property and there's been a home inspection or they notice something uh, in the course of that where visually they were able to identify an issue. Um, A lot of times, especially a lot of our more sensitive clients will contact us because they're feeling something. Uh, they're feeling that reaction. They notice uh, a common story we hear is uh, they'll feel like garbage in their home. Then they'll go on vacation somewhere else for a couple weeks and they'll feel great. And then they'll come back home and they'll feel like garbage again. Mm. And that's enough for them to draw the connection. Hey, maybe there's something in my home uh, that's really causing this. 
Uh, but whether it's a visible issue, sometimes it's an odor. Uh, that tends to be a very, very prominent one because that that musty odor is a telltale sign of a mold problem. Um, regardless of exactly why, generally they'll either contact us uh, or they'll contact a partner of ours that does environmental testing uh, to confirm or identify, okay, do I have a mold problem? And if so, where is it coming from? Um, and that can be done through a variety of different uh, testing methods to help identify if there is a mold issue, how significant is it? Um, and there's there's all kinds of different testing methods from uh, surface sampling, for instance, which is, hey, I see this discoloration. Let me take a sample of that and identify, is it mold growth or is it something like efflorescence where um, that can go hand in hand with mold, but isn't mold. Uh, so they can send that out to the lab and test for it. Uh, we're big proponents of air testing uh, or air cell testing where they'll actually We'll take a sample of the air inside the home, compare that to the air on the outside of the home to really identify, okay, are the types of mold that are present on the inside similar to the ones on the outside? And are the counts similar? Because again, mold's everywhere. Mm -hmm. You're never going to get yeah. no mold in your air. So what we want to see is that the levels on the inside of your home are comparable to that on the outside. Yeah, that makes sense. Is it possible that, you know, like for instance, where I live now, I've got no indication that there's any excessive mold anywhere. I feel good. Is it possible that there is still a problem here? Possible, yes. Uh, I would say likely is not so much. If there's no, if there's zero indication whatsoever, um, it's fairly unlikely. The one thing I will say is you do got to be careful about things like nose blindness. Um, sometimes people, you get, you get accustomed to the smells around you. Mm -hmm. So you may not think there's an odor, but then you have friends or relatives that come over that don't live there and they immediately go, what's, what's that musty smell? What's, what's going on there? So, um, sometimes people aren't necessarily the most observant and that can definitely be an issue. And there, there can be, uh, issues that are harder to identify. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's very, very seldom would I say that somebody who had a, thorough inspection of the home and everything looked clean that there's actually something hidden going on with absolutely no uh, smell indications, no visual indications, no known history of water damage. Uh, and that's why typically uh, anytime uh, we start to investigate for a client, one of the first things we will do is go through verbally and just try to identify as much as we can about the history of the property to identify are there potential issues? And if so, where would they be? Because uh, the last thing we want to do, I mean, the only way to be 100% certain there is zero mold in a property uh, or zero active growth in a property would be to rip everything down to the studs and thoroughly inspect everything. And obviously yeah. that's not a practical uh, practice. Yeah. You're listening to the Radical Health Rebel Podcast. Are you regularly suffering from painful bloating and wind that can be smelly and embarrassing? Are your bowel movements not as they should be, either constipation or diarrhea, or possibly alternating between the two? Do you find the pain is bad enough, but the bloating and cramps make you feel awful and are affecting your everyday life? Do you sometimes feel you can't eat properly because of the wind, bloating and pain? And has your doctor told you that you have IBS, but unable to help find you a solution? Do you feel right now that you simply don't know what's causing your symptoms and whatever your doctor has suggested hasn't worked and you feel frustrated that you're still far from having a normal, flat, comfortable tummy? Have you invested a lot of time, energy and money into improving your symptoms and don't wish to waste any more? Do you feel frustrated and depressed and don't feel like you can take part in all the activities you enjoy and sometimes have to cancel attending events because of the way your tummy feels? Do you fear that if you don't get this sorted, you could end up with a much more serious gastrointestinal disease? Well, if so, what would help you right now is to understand the root cause of your digestive condition, rather than continuing to try to mask the symptoms with over-the-counter or prescribed medications. You need help understanding how factors such as nutrition, gut health, stress, and toxicology affect the digestive system, and how to optimize these factors. You need someone who can advise, motivate, and support you every step of the way 
someone who has walked the path before and taught many others to do the same. What you need is my Overcome Your Digestive Issues program. My Overcome Your Digestive Issues program can help you in the following ways. I will help you understand the root causes of your digestive problems and teach you how to approach the condition holistically via expert advice on nutrition and lifestyle factors. The Overcome Your Digestive Issues program will start by ensuring you are on the right diet for you based on your genetics or metabolic type and one that avoids the foods that are known to exacerbate your condition. We'll go on a journey step by step, learning all the necessary lifestyle changes required to achieve a flat, comfortable, pain-free tummy. Each weekly 30-minute coaching session will include advice, support and guidance specifically tailored to your needs and at a speed that is right for you. Once you're eating right for your metabolic type, you will begin to see changes in how your tummy feels and we will also uncover all the necessary blocking factors that you may have and you'll be taught how to reduce, replace or eliminate all the factors that are causing your digestive problems. Ultimately, this program will enable you to achieve a flat, calm and comfortable tummy every day for the rest of your life. For more information about how to improve your gut health and to claim a complimentary no-obligation gut health consultation, please go to www.bodycheck.co.uk, that's B-O-D-Y-C-H-E-K, and fill in the request form at the top of the homepage and we'll be in contact to arrange a convenient time. Now, back to the podcast. Yeah, I've got you. Yeah, I mean, in my previous home, there was definitely, there was definitely a mould issue. And it'll be quite interesting after I ask you my next question to see. I've got a feeling that what I did probably wasn't a good idea. <laughs> so, so yeah, that, that leads me on nicely to the next question, which is what are the main procedures to fixing a mold or a moisture problem? Yeah. So um, really when we're talking about that, we're talking about two different issues. So there's the moisture problem. Uh, something caused a, there's some sort of water intrusion going on uh, or humidity problem, but something having to do with moisture uh, is getting to excess levels in the home and that is triggering mold growth. Uh, mold growth can begin to grow in as few as 24 hours after a water intrusion event. So it can come up pretty quickly. Um, but also it's stuff that can take, can uh, occur over long periods of time with just not really noticing it. Typically uh, like with humidity issues, we see those where there's just excess humidity in the home that the home's not able to properly ventilate and uh, manage. And over time, that causes an issue that just gets worse and worse and worse to the point where somebody finally notices it. Those can be some of the hardest ones to identify because, uh, uh, again, you just get used to your environment. You, uh, you get that nose blindness and you just kind of get immune to it. So um, immune to observing it, I should say. But going back to it, uh, as far as practices and what should actually be done to resolve well, first the water issue, that's going to be completely dependent on how is moisture getting in. And that's something that can be very uh, complicated because there's a myriad of different issues. I mean, we see everything uh, very commonly. We see a lot of foundation issues. Uh, so where people have water coming in from the exterior foundation, uh, seeping in through their basement or crawl space, uh, and then getting into the home. Uh, you can obviously have pipe leaks, uh, any sort any issues with your plumbing system, uh, issues with your HVAC system, uh, any sort of air conditioning is going to have uh, condensate that's going to come off it. That needs to be properly managed and dealt with. Um, if that's not, that can be a big source of mold. Uh, really, anywhere that you have water introduced in your home, it can be a problem. And things like uh, the, some of the most interesting and most uh, challenging ones to identify are ones that are not based on actual water, but based on that humidity. Uh, or airflow issues. So things having to do with insulation, improperly or aged windows where they're allowing a lot of air in, uh, that can create some very interesting situations just depending on uh, the environment on the outside of the home as you hit different temperature discrepancies. Right now I'm in Pittsburgh and it is uh, five degrees Fahrenheit, which inside my house it is uh, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, give or take. Humidity is very, very high inside the home compared to what it is on the outside. So just those temperature differentials have the potential to create significant issues. So 
uh, there's there's a whole variety of uh, different ways that we can have water problems that can create a mold issue. Um, and depending on what those are, they'll need to be dealt with, obviously, very different ways. But that's something that a good mold professional should at least help uh, identify why is the mold problem there in the first place and what are the underlying water issues. Now, when it comes to resolving the mold problem itself, um, really there's there's a few core steps. Everybody's process is likely to be a little bit different, uh, but there's a few core steps that are going to exist in any good remediation plan. Uh, the first one should always be containment. And this is really where we are isolating off the area that we're going to be working on, the area where the growth is, uh, from the remainder of the property. So we're setting up plastic barriers uh, with poly sheeting. We're making sure that everything is as airtight as we can get it. And same thing with any HVAC uh, duct work. Want to make sure that's all isolated. Um, and we're really trying to get that as contained off as we can because during the next few steps, uh, we're actually going to make the problem a bit worse before we make it better. And so we want to make sure the containment is as solid as we can get it. And then we're going to set up mechanical controls to help prevent cross-contamination as well. This is generally going to be air scrubbers or negative air machines to basically put the area that we're working on under negative pressure. Uh, and really what that does is no matter what kind of containment we do, it's never going to be 100% perfect. There's always likely to be some air leakage. But if we can uh, isolate that area and put it under negative pressure... If there are any gaps in that uh, containment, it's going to be pulling air from the untreated area into the area that we're working on, rather than moving air from the area that the, the working area out into the remainder of the home. So uh, that's a, regardless of what we're doing, that should always be the first steps for any real uh, removal project or mold remediation project. Uh, from there, it's going to come down to proper removal of the mold which is going to depend very much on what surface it's growing on. So in most cases, it's going to be removing the building material. So whether it's drywall, sheetrock, uh, insulation, carpeting, uh, flooring, what have you, uh, almost always that material is going to need to be removed, um, with the exception of very non-porous materials, uh, can be cleaned typically. Uh, because with a, a non-porous material, the mold's not actually growing into the material itself, it's growing on the dust on the biofilm that accumulates on that material. Uh, so those typically can be cleaned, whereas your porous materials, your natural wood products, all that kind of stuff, most of that's going to be removed. After the removal's done, there's at some point in the process, there's going to be HEPA vacuuming, typically at multiple points in the process, uh, where the areas are actually vacuumed with a HEPA, HEPA filtration level of vacuum. Um, they're also going to be sprayed and wiped down to uh, physically contact remove. Uh, as much of the biofilm and mold growth as we can. Um, and then generally, once all of the physical uh, cleaning and removal is done, uh, almost every practice is going to end uh, with an application of some form of disinfectant, uh, just as a really, it, this is one of the ones where uh, it can get very tricky with a lot of different companies. Unfortunately, there are some companies out there that will jump straight to the disinfectant portion. And they'll just go in, they'll uh, fog or electrostatic spray with the disinfectant and call it good. And that's definitely not anywhere near enough. But that should be a part of a good remediation plan as the final sort of catch-all. There's no matter what, no matter how much physical cleaning we do, there's always likely to be something left behind. Uh, so that is really what that disinfection steps for. It's just to kind of get that final Final step, try to get everything up, and then typically it'll be followed up by a final wipe down to remove any lingering uh, uh, disinfectant or anything that's been there. So is, is it the disinfectant that you use on the non-porous surfaces as well? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Uh, it's generally going to be actually a combination. Um, we typically will not start with a disinfectant. Uh, we'll generally start with some form. We have a variety of different products that we utilize, uh, but some form of cleaner degreaser. Uh, because really with that first step, what we're trying to do is uh, physically remove it. We're not trying to kill it. We want to actually remove the biofilm and remove as much of the actual growth as we can. So that's better suited with a uh, cleaner degreaser agent to really kind of break the bonds between the mold or the biofilm and the surface. Uh, and then the disinfectant is more at the end to just kind of treat whatever might be remaining. That's quite interesting because that's pretty much 
you know, what we do as functional medicine practitioners, when we've got certain, you know, microbes in the body that are surrounded by biofilm, we do the same, pretty much the same thing. Probably not the same yeah. substances, but but the process, the process is uh, is exactly the same. Well, it's it's so important too, and it became uh, it's interesting because it really came to light a lot with COVID as well. Uh, the this whole idea of disinfecting, and uh, I mean, it's funny the electrostatic sprayers that we've been using for years. Uh, shot up in price 400%. Uh, and we couldn't get our hands on basically any of them at the time. But uh, it really, it became the the whole idea of disinfecting areas just immediately came into the limelight and public started talking about it more. And we saw some really terrible practices going on. Uh, people that would just go in and literally just disinfect and just fog uh, areas and expect that to really work. And it doesn't. I mean, we always use the analogy with clients. If uh, you go into a kitchen and you cook a big meal uh, and you just, you're going to create a huge mess. You're going to get splatters everywhere, depending on what you're cooking. You're going to get oil and grease and all those kind of things on all the surfaces. You can't just come in afterwards and spray a bunch of Lysol on it and go, okay, I cleaned the kitchen. That doesn't make sense. That doesn't work. And that's the same way whenever we talk about uh, disinfecting, whether it's for COVID or disinfecting for uh, mold. You need to clean the underlying surfaces first. You need to remove the biofilm. You need to remove that material, and then you can disinfect. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so going back to my where I used to live, I'm going back a few years now. So it <laughs> suffered really badly from from mold because it it suffered a lot from condensation, which I think partly was due because it didn't have cavity wall insulation. So the walls were yep. very cold. Yep. And then, you know, you have furniture up against the wall, so there's no air flowing through. Yep. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily see it unless you pulled furniture out. Yep. So for, for me, the winter time, and this is what I was alluding to earlier, cause I'm pretty sure I wasn't doing the right thing. <laughs> As soon as I'd start to see it grow, I would just get the bleach out and I would just start, you know, killing what was there. And I, at the time, I kind of thought, mm, probably not doing the right things, probably not even safe for me to be doing it that way, but I didn't know what else to do. You know, I guess what I was thinking of as well when you were speaking about the COVID situation and people spraying, you know, disinfectant around. Well, the other thing is, if you breathe that in, you're now killing all the microbes in your lungs and your mm -hmm. and your oral and your nasal cavities, which are part of your immune system. Yep. So, you know, that, that to me, I mean, I think they're still doing it in China, but you know, that to me was absolutely crazy because you're weakening the one thing that you need to protect yourself against a so-called virus, right? Is your immune system. And, yeah. And that's, that's the best case scenario. Mm. I mean, that's assuming you're using a disinfectant, like a, uh, one, we have a variety of different ones because we deal with so many clients that have uh, chemical, multiple chemical sensitivity. Uh, they may react to certain products and not to others. So we have a variety of different ones that we use. Uh, but one that we use very commonly is hypochlorous acid uh, because it's really one of the most, uh, I hate to use this term, but natural disinfectants that we can get. Um, it's very easy to produce and it's very, very effective. Um, and it's got a Compared to most out there, it's got a very good safety profile. Um, so yeah, if you breathe that in at the bare minimum, you're killing the microbes uh, in your system and you're potentially weakening it. Uh, but then you go into a lot of the other products that have been used for disinfectants. And some of these have very harsh safety profiles. Mm. Um, I mean, there was a, an article, ironically, I think I was reading it, came out in 2019, uh, that was studying, it was based on, I believe it was hotel and hospitality workers um, and high levels of cancer from cleaning materials that they had been using. Uh, because obviously, if you're in uh, the hospitality industry, particularly in like a housekeeping setting, you're using cleaners constantly. Mm. Um, and even with spray bottles without using really fogging implementations, they're still breathing a lot of that in. Mm. Um, and a lot of these products can be rough. So we always strive to use the uh, products with the best possible safety pro profile, as well as using as little product as we can to be effective at what we're doing. Yeah, I would, I would imagine your your staff are wearing suits and masks and everything else, yep. you know. Yeah. 
Yep, full full Tyvek suits, uh, full mask respirators, organic vapor filters, all that kind of stuff. You don't mean you don't mean the, the paper masks. That have been <laughs> sold. No, the pers- I, I I generally prefer the cloth masks. You just uh, chop the sleeve off your arm and wrap that around your head and uh, go to town. It's in- it's interesting as well as you were speaking. Then something it reminded me of something in in the local gym where I where I train myself. You know, in the last two or three years, they brought in a a rule, although I think they've technically dropped it, but a lot of people are still continuing with it, is that they've got all these bottles of spray hanging up when you walk into the gym and you have to spray anything before you use it and then you have to spray it again after you've used it. And, you know, I understand that people mean well, but I mean, I actually asked them to send me the ingredients because my mm-hmm. the skin on my hands, when they, when they brought it in, because obviously it's it's on the equipment yeah. and the skin on my hand started kind of, it, it looks a bit like eczema, but it's not itchy. So mm-hmm. I thought there's definitely something my skin doesn't like. And so they sent me the, the ingredients and I researched the chemicals and about 90% of the chemicals were all toxic ingredients. <laughs> and it's mainly an, an antibacterial. And you think, why are you spraying an antibacterial? Because you're trying to stop a virus, but you're spraying and everyone's spraying it into the air as well. They're spraying it all, mm-hmm. all over, everywhere. And some some people are still doing it today. You know, they go up to a machine, they spray all over it. They use it for like 30 seconds. And they're actually spraying the machine longer than they're using it. Mm-hmm. And I really, I'm really tempted to say to someone, do you realize that's poison you're spraying and you're spraying it into the air and then you and everyone else has to breathe it in and you're killing your own microbes that are important for your own immune system so you're actually doing more harm than good yeah but i don't say anything because i don't think people would understand even if i told them (laughs) well and i i would love to and i haven't done the study so take that for what it's worth but i would love to take a few different gyms and test them with one group using that method and then another group uh just taking uh water with a little bit of soap and just spraying it down and wiping everything that way and see what the differences are. And my guess is you would have no difference in transmission rates between the two uh, because we know surface transmission hasn't been really much of a thing at all. And even if it was, uh, I mean, COVID was painted to be such a uh, a engineered, gigantic, horrific, like the, the virus to end all viruses and, uh, there's obviously some very, very awful aspects of it for sure. And I'm not trying to downplay that at all. Uh, but as far as viruses go, it's not that hard to kill. Uh, it is, it's fairly easy. It's similar to most other coronaviruses that don't live on surfaces for very long. They're killed very easily by UV light. They're killed very easily by pretty much any disinfectant and they can be removed from the surface very, very easily with almost anything. Mm. So I think there's, there was so much that we did that, uh, uh, wasn't, wasn't based in logic, reason, or science, but was heavily based in fear. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. As you were speaking previously as well, and you were talking about, um, air conditioning units and it's quite yeah. interesting that I think it was last year I went and looked at a house potentially to, to move into because I was looking at, having somewhere that I could have my own gym in the house and it had quite a big kind of ground floor area. And I thought, Oh, that, that could potentially work. And it looks really good in the, in the photos as they generally do. <laughs> but as soon as I walked through the front door, I could smell mold. Yeah. Straight away. And I thought, Oh, cause it was disappointing. Cause it did look really nice, especially from the outside. It did look really nice. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I said to the estate agent, oh, I can smell mold. And, she, and she, she, she almost looked at me as if to say, and so what? And I, and I was thinking, <laughs> you clearly don't understand. And um, I did have a look around and she's like, well, what do you think? And I said, well, it's a bit moldy. And she's like, well, is, is that a problem? And I said, well, yeah, you don't want to live in a moldy <laughs> home. Mm-hmm. And she went, oh, yeah, it's the air conditioning unit. It leaks. And then I looked and you could see there was like a mm-hmm. stain down the wall where, where it had been leaking. And she said, oh, don't worry, they'll paint over that. And I thought, really? Is that all they're going to do? 
Um, so yeah, so that was a that was a no from me. And unfortunately, it's very very common that we see that mm. that practice in play. Yeah, yeah. And jokingly, a lot of the forms and stuff around here called the landlord special of just oh, there's an issue and just slap a coat of paint on top and uh, good to go. And we know that doesn't. That doesn't work. It's not doing anything. And that's, unfortunately, there's uh, a lot of products out there that intentionally or unintentionally can go to perpetuate those ideas. I mean, uh, here, if you go to any home center, you can find uh, mold killing or mold resistant paints, things like that, um, that people think will make that an effective practice. And it, it's just not. It doesn't doesn't work the way that people think that it does yeah i actually had that on in one of my rooms where i used to live and there was mold used to grow on it mm -hmm. it did used to come yeah, I mean, it, it did used to come off easier mm -hmm. but there was definitely yeah but mold still still grew on it yeah i mean for many of them are just that they'll have an antifungal antibacterial just basically a disinfectant baked in with the paint that as soon as you apply it and it dries pretty much any of the actual killing properties are gone. Yeah. Something that you've touched on already, and I'm not sure if it's if there's more to go into, but what are the main um, common sources of excess moisture? Yeah, so we did, did hit on those quite a bit. I mean, really, it, it kind of breaks down into a few different categories. So exterior water infiltration is the first one. That's going to be any of your foundation water issues, um, a lot of these can be maintenance issues that aren't addressed correctly. Old leaky windows, uh, caulking that has been allowed to dry and crack and uh, separate. Uh, even surfaces, uh, if you have a home that's got like wood siding, uh, keeping up on the painting. People think that that's just aesthetic, but it's not. The paint is an essential part to keep water out, mm. keep moisture out. Um, so a lot of those maintenance, maintenance type problems, same thing, uh, roofing. Uh, Roofs that are not properly maintained, uh, particularly the flashing around any sort of protrusions in the roof. So any chimneys or anything like that, um, that's a very, very common area. Any, anywhere you've got two different sources, or anywhere you have two different surfaces that meet and that needs to keep water out, that is a very, very common failure point. So, I mean, those, those exterior issues are very, very common. Uh, then we've got what most people think of, but is a lot less common, and that's your interior pipe leaks, plumbing problems, those kind of things. I mean, they do come up for sure. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, they're definitely a lot more common. Uh, and generally, they tend to be noticed a lot sooner uh, because almost always they're caused by something that people have done. Um, occasionally, you'll get it like, again, today's a very, very cold day. It'll be caused by somebody leaving a door open, and pipes are allowed to freeze, uh, things like that. Or uh, one that we see pretty pretty frequently, uh, somebody's hanging something in their home and they put a nail or a screw through either a drain or a, uh, a water line inside the walls. Um, and that, again, typically you'll notice an issue pretty, pretty quickly there. And then the, the third category would be your humidity-based problems. And not going to, I know I talked a decent bit before, but those are definitely some of the most challenging because they can be a lot a lot harder to both recognize and to problem solve. Get the Radical Health Rebel at free. Head on over to our Patreon channel at www.patreon.com forward slash Radical Health Rebel. It's the only place where you can watch full length, completely ad and sponsor free episodes of the podcast. Plus, you can join the Radical Health Rebel Patreon community where you can have a say in the podcast, watch exclusive behind the scenes clips, as well as early access to the podcast. That's patreon.com forward slash Radical Health Rebel. Just a brief interruption to this podcast to talk about adult acne. Now, did you know that 40 to 54% of men and women older than 25 years will have some degree of facial acne? and that clinical facial acne persists into middle age in 12% of women and 3% of men. I know only too well the devastating effects that acne can have on your confidence and your self-esteem and how it can easily destroy your social life, your career and your relationships. I know this only too well because I suffered from severe cystic acne from age 13 to 31. Over an 18 year period, I visited my doctor on many occasions 
and his only suggestions were acne creams, harsh cleansers, and antibiotics that weren't working and were actually making my skin worse. After 18 years of struggle and thousands of pounds invested in treatments that didn't work, through my professional education, I began to learn that what my doctor had told me was untrue and that diet was directly related to acne, plus other factors such as food sensitivities, toxicity, hormones, and balancing the body's microbiome. Putting what I had learned into practice, I managed to rid myself of acne over 20 years ago and have been helping others to do the same for well over a decade. By teaching people what foods cause acne, what food sensitivities each individual has, how to optimize their detox pathways, how to reduce environmental stresses and toxins, and how to balance hormones, especially those related to the mTOR pathway, a major causal factor with acne, I've been able to help many other adults overcome their acne nightmare too. So if you would like more information on how to overcome your adult acne, please go to www.skinwebinar.com. That's www.skinwebinar.com, where you can also request an acne breakthrough call with me to see if you are suitable for my Eliminate Adult Acne Coaching Program, where you can once and for all learn how to overcome your adult acne. Now, back to the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not sure. I mean, the, the person that bought my previous property, uh, he, he was renting it out to other people. He wasn't living there. And um, I'm just wondering, you know, what the people that moved in after me would have done because you know, you've got to have something against a wall you, know, you mm-hmm. can't, can't have everything in the middle of a room. And there were two walls that were on the outside of the building. So it was an apartment block and those walls get cold. Yep. I, I mean, I had a dehumidifier going 24 seven during you know, six months of the year and that, that didn't do the job. Yeah. I mean that my, my gut reaction on something like that. And some of those properties are just hard. Like there's, there's some that were built at a time where it is, very, very difficult to uh, correct those type of issues. Uh, they just weren't built with that really in mind. And uh, yeah, I mean, dehumidification. Um, thankfully, now there are some methods to adding insulation uh, into older walls, even though I'm sure if it's that old of a property, the they're probably very thin walls, so you don't have a lot of space for it. Uh, but there are some ways that you can add additional insulation, which can help with those issues. But yeah, there's there's some properties that are definitely a lot harder to uh, prevent issues in than others. Yeah, I mean, as a as a health practitioner, you know, if I was working with someone that had health issues and they were living in a property like that, my advice would be do everything you can to move. Mm-hmm. Just move to a property where you don't have that issue. Let someone else deal with the issue. You know, that's, I mean, that wasn't why I moved, but it's certainly one of the benefits of moving that I no longer have a moldy yep. home. But, you know, I would say to someone, even if you've got a mortgage on that property, rent it to someone else and rent somewhere else yourself. That's not, mm-hmm. that's not moldy. You know, if you, particularly if you've got a health problem, because you might find it, if you're constantly in that environment, your health problems just not going to get any better. Yep. You know, yep. The, the analogy that I've used before on this podcast is, you know, if you if you imagine you're you're on a lake in a rowing boat and the boat springs a leak, you've got two choices. And this is this is a health analogy that I often use. You can get a bucket and tip the water out, but you're gonna have to continually keep tipping the water out because the water's gonna continue coming in. And the analogy that I normally say is, well, that analogy is what the medical system do. They 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 give you a bucket of water and you've got to constantly tip the water out, which might be his medication that you've got to take for the rest of your life. Whereas as a health practitioner, I teach people how to plug the hole. Mm -hmm. Yep. But but when we're talking about mold in the home, you have to do both. Yep. You have to tip the water out and you have to plug the hole. Yep. Yep. And that's, uh, it's something again, thankfully in the States, we don't have as many homes that are, I would say similar in that way where they're just, we have a lot more new construction, uh, so they typically don't have those same issues, but they've got a variety of different problems. I mean, we see uh, one of the most interesting things, as time has gone on, uh, the building practices that we've used have changed pretty dramatically. Mm-hmm. Um, and 
for certain periods, we did things that we thought were really smart. And in hindsight, they were, and they've continued to be used as building practices. And other times we've done things that in hindsight were really, really dumb and is not something that we should have continued using. And uh, so much of it is also regionally based because we have to deal with different conditions outside. I mean, if you were to construct a home where I am in Pittsburgh and plop it down in Florida, it would be completely inadequate to dealing with hurricane force winds and the amount of rain that they have. Mm. Same thing's reversed. If you take one of theirs and put it up here, it would not work at all in the winter. The insulation would be completely inadequate uh, and you'd have a, a whole litany of different problems. But uh, we, we do some of these things. I mean, we saw a uh, big issue. There was a couple different builders around here that for the sake of energy efficiency, um, homes have been being built more tight, more airtight year after year, which in general is a good thing. Uh, and it can be great for indoor air quality. Uh, but if done incorrectly, it can also be terrible. And they had a practice where they were putting uh, uh, behind the drywall, they were putting a vapor barrier in, which vapor barriers are commonly used both in the south where we've got continuous cooling season. So they're basically running their AC almost exclusively. And then uh, in places like Canada, they're also commonly used where they're heating their homes almost exclusively. Uh, but in a mixed climate like ours, it's a recipe for disaster because regardless of where you put it, you're going to have water. Uh, you're going to hit condensation, hit dew point at somewhere in there. Uh, it's going to hit along that vapor barrier. And sure enough, so many of these homes that had that had mold growth because humid air in the winter inside the home was just slowly uh, going, it was penetrating the drywall, hitting that vapor barrier, hitting dew point because it's inside the wall and causing significant mold problems throughout the home. Mm. Uh, and I mean, so one family in particular, I remember they only noticed it because at the corner of one of their windows, they started to notice some black on this side of the drywall. And then as we pulled that down and got into it, there was it was significant and spread much, much further than it initially looked. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if someone smells mold in their home, how do they find the mold or indeed the, the moisture problem? So uh, the first thing I always recommend is take a flashlight and look around, just go through particularly, like you mentioned, exterior walls. That's a very, very big one, both for humidity issues as well as for water intrusion problems. So move the furniture out away from the walls. Uh, try to avoid storing things and packing things tightly against walls. The more air you can allow, the better. Um, especially around here, we've got a lot of people that have basements and they'll use basements for storage, uh, which is fine. But ideally use plastic or use water resistant containers. Don't use cardboard. That's an amazing food source for mold. Um, and they'll have cardboard boxes piled up against the basement foundation walls. So any humidity that gets trapped back there, any water from the outside that comes in, it just finds an immediate food source and is allowed to stay saturated and continue growing. So, um, moving all those things away from the walls. If you smell anything, uh, get back in there, take a flashlight, look as closely as you can. Most cases, especially if you think about areas that don't have a lot of airflow, you'll begin to find something or you'll you'll start to identify it. If you don't, that's when it would be time to tap in a professional. Or if you do, that's likely time to tap in a professional as well. Mm. Uh, you'll just be able to be a lot more informed, which is definitely helpful. Yeah, yeah that's good advice. And what's uh, radon gas and how does it impact health? Yeah, so radon gas is something I'm really passionate about because uh, unfortunately, it's something that a lot of people are uh, very ignorant of. Um, now this is something that region, it can exist. It exists in all 50 U S states. Um, and it exists in most parts of the world to varying degrees. Uh, some areas are a lot, have a lot more significant issues than others because radon is based on their geology. So radon is a radioactive gas. Uh, it's part of the decay cycle of uranium. So basically we have uranium in the soil beneath our homes, uh, that as it breaks down, it goes through its, uh, decay cycle if we go back to high school chemistry. And eventually in that decay cycle, it becomes radon gas. So radon's a gas. It comes up through the soil, through cracks in the bedrock, filters through gravel and soil and everything. Eventually, if it's existing under our homes, 
It will find cracks in our foundation. It'll find uh, perforations in the foundation for plumbing, all those kind of things, and it will seep into our homes. And the problem is whenever we breathe in radon gas, uh, it continues its radioactive decay. It decays within our lungs, uh, emits alpha particles that damage our lungs and can uh, eventually cause lung cancer. Uh, so it's a significant issue. And uh, one of the biggest problems with it is it is colorless, it's odorless, it's tasteless. We have no way of detecting it whatsoever with our natural senses. So the only way to know if you have a radon issue is to have it tested. So is there a specific uh, geographical region that is exposed to that or is it everywhere? It can be pretty much everywhere. There are definitely some areas based on their geology that are a lot worse. Uh, and there are some areas that, based on the type of soil types they have and everything, tend to have lower levels. Um, but it can exist really anywhere. It's all about the actual makeup of the earth underneath your underneath your feet. And is there any specific areas that are more likely to have radon exposure? Yeah. So for instance, uh, U.S. has some pretty significant issues. Um, if you look up, uh, if you, you can Google uh, U.S. radon map or for most areas, you can find a radon map and it will typically be identified uh, red, yellow and or red, orange and yellow. Red being the highest radon concentrations, yellow, uh, orange being uh, the middle and then yellow being the lowest. And what you'll see whenever you look at those for like the U.S., for example, Along the Appalachian Mountains and everything, so it's sort of coming down from the Northeast down through the Virgi Pennsylvania, through the Virginias, uh, into Ohio and all that, uh, down into the Carolinas, uh, you'll see a very strong red streak through there. And then a lot in the uh, uh, northern Midwest, uh, you'll see some very, very high concentrations. Generally, once you get into your more southern states, Texas, Florida, they tend to be a lot lower, but it can be uh, problematic levels anywhere because it's so locally based um unfortunately there's there's a very common idea that like oh it's it's very area based which it is in general um but something we hear a lot is oh my neighbor tested for radon and they didn't have a problem so that means i don't either and that really could not be farther from the truth I mean, we uh i was really curious whenever we initially got into it uh, i tested my house my neighbor on one side neighbor on the other side uh, neighbor across the street next to them and then across the street from them. So uh, I think it was a total of six uh, houses that we tested, all within uh, 100 yards, 100 meters or so of one another. And what we found was radon readings that went anywhere from basically right on the threshold of what the US EPA recommends for mitigation up to five times the threshold. All just with, and some of them being right next to each other. So it's very, very much an individual issue based on your particular home. And there's a, there's just so many different factors that go into it. The, the core one being what's the actual geology like underneath your feet, which you have no way of knowing. Um, but then other factors like uh, the construction of the home, the siding choices, all of those can impact how the, how air pressure works in your home because homes are subjected to what's known as the stack effect which basically your house will act like a big chimney. So air will naturally move up from the lower levels uh, into the higher levels of the home. And what that does is it puts the lowest levels under suction. So uh, the more suction that the lower levels are under, the more they're going to pull in soil gases from the subsoil underneath the home. And that can be a huge factor in how much radon comes into your home and how high the levels get. And is there any signs or symptoms that might alert someone to, to get tested for radon? So eventually you will start to notice, uh, again, respiratory issues. So it, it causes lung dam damage, those sort of asthmatic type symptoms, coughing, wheezing, trouble breathing, shortness of breath, uh, all of that. But that can take a while to develop. Uh, and really, whenever we're talking about radon, but any environmental issue, um, it's exposure over time that's the problem. So it's the fact that we're living in our homes, we're spending so much time in them more than we ever did in the past. We don't mm. don't go outside anywhere near as much as we should. Mm. Uh, COVID somehow made that a lot worse, even though it should have made it better for a variety of reasons. Uh, and 
as we spend this much time in our homes, we're just constantly being exposed to it. And that prolonged exposure is really where the problem comes in. So would you suggest that it would be quite prudent for everyone to, to test their home for radon? I, I am a big advocate for that. Um, I would at bare, bare, bare minimum check out throughout throughout your local area's health authority or your nation's health authority uh, what the radon levels are in various areas. Almost every country that I've looked at, every developed nation has some information on uh, radon in their area. And there's definitely some where it's probably not worth it. Mm. But particularly, to be honest, I'm a little ignorant on the uh, EU nations uh, and their individual areas. Uh, but I know everyone in the United States, everyone in Canada, 100% should test. Right. Gotcha. Just going back to, to mold, what would you say to people who they see mold in their home and their solution is to stick on a pair of rubber gloves and rub it down with bleach. What would you say to those people? So um, I'll start with the most generous version. Um, if it's uh, if it's on a completely non-porous surface, if you've got it growing on, say, like a, a sealed porcelain or a lot of sealed tile, those kind of things, uh, metal, glass, anything like that. Like a lot, of, a lot of times we'll see it in bathrooms, for instance, where it's on, uh, you've got like a fiberglass tub uh, and you've got something growing there. Honestly, it's not that terrible of an idea because really what you're doing there is you're cleaning the film that's on top of it. You're removing that um, and the mold's not able to grow into those surfaces. So if it's a situation like that, go to town, do do what you can to protect yourself. Um, I would definitely recommend wearing a mask, the best quality that you can. Keep the area ventilated. What, you should have a, a vent fan in the bathroom. Sorry, what mask would you recommend? Uh, N95 or better. Okay. Yeah, N95 for mold is uh, not necessarily the best you can get, but it's the, the best that most people are going to have common access to. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, one of those surfaces, turn the open the window, turn the vent fan on, uh, try to get as much ventilation and everything that you can. And, um, but if you're doing it in that type of situation, you're probably, probably okay. Mm -hmm. um, same thing a lot of times we'll see, uh, uh, and I don't spend a lot of time talking about these, but there's a variety of different TikTok videos and some YouTube channels that will focus on mold in other areas like mold in appliances and things like that, like around refrigerator seals and and coffee makers and all those kind of things. Um, and my advice on those would generally be the same because typically where you're seeing it on there, it's going to be on silicone or rubber or uh, plastic, those, those type of surfaces. Do what you can to ventilate it and keep yourself safe. Uh, but in general, those are cleaning. And with most of these types of situations, it is a cleaning and maintenance problem almost exclusively. Um, so if you keep up on cleaning, you keep up on removing the biofilm that exists, you're not going to have a mold problem. It's whenever you neglect that, that those can come up. Yeah. Um, now, if you're doing that and it's mold on drywall or sheetrock or anything like that, that's definitely not something I would recommend. Um, it's, that's where I would recommend, uh, at bare minimum contact a licensed regulated mold professional and get their advice on it before you proceed with something like that. Because, uh, unfortunately in some circumstances you can probably do it and you, you'll probably be okay. It might not be the worst thing. Uh, but there's other, other situations like, again, going back to the one where they had the vapor barrier inside the wall, uh, you would very quickly open up a tremendous issue uh, by trying to clean it and do any sort of removal on your own without proper containment. And uh, again, during that removal process, whenever professionals uh, removing mold, they're removing drywall, they're removing uh, trim, any building material like that, they're doing it under proper containment, proper mechanical controls, and they're using techniques to minimize the creation of dust uh, and how much of it becomes airborne. But the containment and the mechanical controls also help to minimize the dust and keep it under control whenever it is created. Because no matter what, if you're cutting out building material, you're going to create dust. You're going to stir up these issues a lot more. So, I mean, if we were to, if we were able to do a like real time monitor of mold levels during a remediation project, it would start out very low whenever it's not being touched. 
they would skyrocket as we begin the removal process. And then they would go back down and go down to levels lower than they initially were at the end and post the uh, remediation. So what would be potentially the danger of someone slapping on some rubber gloves and getting some disinfectant and rubbing down their drywalls? What would be the, the negative effects of that? So first and foremost, you're not doing much of anything. Um, you're really not going to kill much of it. Uh, bleach, for instance, it's basically a one-to-one ratio between the bleach molecules and the mold spores. So you will kill some mold, um, but that mold can also release mycotoxins as you're doing it, which is why we don't, by default, kill it. We want to remove it. You'll also, once the bleach has lost its potency by killing whatever mold it comes into contact with, uh, what's left is tons of water. So you've now fed the mold that's there. Um, and in all likelihood, it's probably not just on the surface. It is likely more significant that than that. It's likely going uh, into the building material or coming from the other side of the building material, and you're just now seeing it. Mm. I mean, this is something we see all the time is uh, somebody will call us up because they see just a little bit of mold. It'll look like kind of an arc of mold coming up from the top of their baseboard. And they'll be like, oh, I just have a couple inches. It's not a big deal at all. And sure enough, there's water coming in from behind that wall, whether it be an exterior wall and they've got some sort of water intrusion or something. Uh, We remove the baseboard. Baseboard's covered in mold. It's just that that's where it had finally wicked high enough up the wall that you can see it. And then we cut into the drywall and the cavity's absolutely filled. And what you don't want to do is be in a situation where you go, uh, it's like pulling the thread on a sweater. You just start with something small that you think is innocent, and then before you know it, the whole thing's unwound, and you've created a bigger issue because it's almost always done without proper containment. So now everything, you've just taken an issue that was relatively contained, and you've exposed your entire home to it. Yeah. Yeah. So what's next for you, Tim? So next for me is uh, we're looking to continue growth for our company, both with our Pittsburgh office, but uh, we started franchising last year. So we currently have one franchisee and we're looking to continue to grow that because uh, I feel what we're doing is really, really important. There's a whole lot of customers that uh, we've been able to help in the Pittsburgh area that I know exist outside of our area and we want to be able to continue to serve them. So I thought the best way that we can do that is through franchising. It's done amazing things for for my family from a business perspective. And I think that that's a great opportunity for others that want to get into the industry, want to help people. Uh, they can do that and uh, really make a difference. And that is that just US wide, the franchise? At the moment, yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So right now we're, we're uh, completely in the US. Um, from there, we'll, we'll see where it goes. And are there any particular regions that you think might be a a very good uh, business proposition for people. I mean, mold exists everywhere. We're particularly looking at Northeast uh, and going down South. So everywhere from uh, Maine to the Carolinas over, I mean, really kind of anywhere, but particularly anywhere, uh, anywhere you've got mold issues, which is most everywhere in the States yeah, and world. Yeah. So <laughs> Probably um, the, the only place that, might not be too great is Antarctica because there's not many buildings there. Yes. <laughs> there's not many buildings. <laughs> might might have a little shortage of customers, yeah. but yeah. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So where can the audience get more details about about your um, program? Yeah, so if you just go to uh, moldmedics.com, uh, that'll have all the information about us, moldmedics, uh, or moldmedicsfranchising.com. Uh, we'll take you to details about our franchising opportunities. And then you can find us on all the usual, usual social media sites as well. Uh, we've really been making an effort to expand our uh, presence, particularly on YouTube. Um, and really, a lot of 2021 for us, and uh, or excuse me, a lot of 2022 for us, and big focus in 2023 is expanding our education. So making sure that we're trying to get as much great content as we can out to people so uh, they can feel empowered and really a lot more confident whenever they encounter a mold or an indoor air quality issue. Yeah, that sounds great. Tim, thank you so much uh, for taking your time out today. One of, the, one of the reasons why I started this podcast is so I can learn from my guests, and I've definitely learned some things from you today, which is great. 
And to all the Radical Health Rebel tribe, if you know someone that would benefit from watching or hearing this episode, please make sure to share the love and forward it onto them. After all, the mission of this show is to help people lead a more fun-filled, healthy, productive, fulfilling and happy life. And if you'd like to support the podcast, you can at patreon.com forward slash Radical Health Rebel, where you can also receive lots of other exclusive premium content, including unedited, full-length ad-free video episodes, monthly Ask Me Anything Q&A sessions and discounts on my coaching programs. So that's all from Tim and me for this week. But don't forget, you can join me same time, same place next week on the Radical Health Rebel podcast. Thanks for tuning in to the Radical Health Rebel podcast with Lee Brandon. You can find Lee at www.bodycheck.co.uk. That's B-O-D-Y-C-H-E-K.co.uk. Please hit the like button and share on your social media. And with someone you feel will benefit from watching this episode. So together, we can help them lead a healthier, more productive, fulfilling and happy life. 